and good evening everyone welcome to our evening talk tonight I thought I'd talk about one way of looking at what do we get out of the practice there's many different ways of looking at what we get out of the practice you can talk about. I mean, mostly this is a question for meditators relating to the good things that come from meditation. And I've warned against <coughs> um, putting too much of our energy into ascertaining whether we are acquiring or achieving or obtaining positive results from our practice at least on a on a you know sort of general overall level and that in that regard we're better off focusing on what good results we get in the present moment from the practice because that's real when you look back and say, I've practiced all these hours, what am I getting out of this? How can you judge that? Are you going to judge it by how you feel right now? Because maybe right now you feel find it kind of crappy, you know? There could be many reasons for why you feel the way you feel right now. And if if you try and discern whether you're better or worse because of meditation, it, you know, it's it's quite complicated. There's no gauge you can look at. And because our moods fluctuate, it's it's problematic. And this leads to a lot of doubt sometimes for meditators. So I've talked about this a lot. We doubt, and doubt is a funny thing because you might be so confident and sure of something one moment and think this meditation is just the bomb and then five minutes later you're ready to call it quits thinking because suddenly your mood has changed our mind can be very fickle be careful don't get caught up in the moods of the mind so that's not what I want to talk about tonight although it's always good to mention to provide encouragement that if you want to see the benefits of meditation, find them in the present moment. Ask yourself what the state of mind of a mindful person is truly like. Is it pure or is it impure? Is it wholesome or unwholesome? Is it beneficial or harmful? And that's what you should see. If you can't see the purity of the mindful state of mind, then okay, then I would say you've got a problem. It may not be comfortable. It's not meant to be comfortable. But it's meant to be honest and pure. And it won't, it doesn't mean you'll sit for an hour and feel very pure, but the moments when you're actually mindful, your whole perception will change. You'll go from this sort of foggy, sense of concepts and ideas to suddenly a clear sense of oh here I am sitting in this room awareness clear awareness of experiences yes now there's this experience then this experience you'll see your emotions for what they are your judgments for what they are and rather than a clinging to them or identifying with them You'll objectify them. That is what it is, and you'll let it go. And you'll see the purity in that. You'll see how that constitutes a positive direction, so that it's, it's uh, involved in the cultivation of positive habits, and then you can let it go from there and, and conclude that whatever comes from this will be positive, because the seed is positive just as the seed of a 
of an oak tree only brings oak trees. So that's enough of that. What I did want to talk about today was what you should expect on the bad side. Buddhists, as I was talking yesterday, were such pessimists. Always focusing on the bad side of things, right? We're like doctors. Doctors are terrible people. They're always focusing on sickness, right? What's wrong with all these doctors focusing on sickness? Why don't they start? Why don't they focus on what's healthy about us? You know, examine the parts of us that are healthy. Yes, I've I've investigated your liver and it's perfectly good condition. But doctor, I have a heart condition. Well, yes, but your liver is very healthy. Aren't you interested in that? No, no, I'm not. You see? You see the problem with this sort of thinking. We want it to be happy. Why don't we focus on the happy spots? Why don't I teach you meditation that's calm and comfortable, pleasant? Mm -hmm. Because we're much more interested in the bad bits, the problematic parts. Those aspects of our existence that we'd rather be without are those aspects of our, our existence that are causing us experiences that we'd rather be without. So in fact, suffering is the symptom. What we want to find out is why we're suffering, right? We all do. Why me? Why Why God? And so we focus on we focus on the problems and the problems are layered there is the symptom which is this the problems the sufferings right and then there is the cause which is our expectations clinging right but it clinging means any kind of uh, desire for an outcome that something should come to be that something something should cease a desire to obtain an experience. And there's another layer, and that's the reason why this is problematic, the reason why why craving leads to suffering. And that's really the essence. What stops you from clinging is ignorance, is seeing thinking that or perceiving that certain things are pleasant or are, are stable, satisfying and controllable stable, satisfying and controllable now that unfortunately is, is delusion that's illusion. That's not how reality works. And so what you see quite quickly through the meditation practice, if it's a meditation practice on reality, what you see is quite problematic. It's quite uncomfortable. And it leads people to think that this sort of meditation is itself problematic and and you s you know uh, dangerous perhaps or um, something's wrong with this meditation practice. <laughs> but the the perception that something's wrong is so important. It's the wake up call. I'm practicing. I'm doing what you said, but something's wrong. What do you mean? Well, the more I practice, the more chaotic it becomes. That's not how reality is supposed to be, right? It's supposed to be stable. The more I practice, the more unpleasantness. You know? I can't find anything to hold on to. It's all unsatisfying. 
That's not how reality, you know, wh where's the happy stuff? The more I practice, the more uncontrollable it is, the more I feel like I'm forcing everything. You know, I can't get a grip on this. I can't figure out how to make it work. You know, what do I do? How do I control this? Basically, is what we're saying. How do I control my mind? I ask. You see where I'm going with this. There are three things you have to come to see from the practice. Uh, three things you will see, and so to put it in a sense that some things you have to see is is misleading, and it leads to worry in the meditators' minds. Meditators become like. Um, a person looking at a tiger and asking where its stripes are. Now if you see a tiger, you see its stripes. But if you tell the person, look, okay, I want you to look at it, that you're going to see a tiger and I want you to find its stripes. And it's kind of like the meditator goes and takes a magnifying glass and tries to find these stripes. So what I mean is a meditator will often be concerned worried about whether they're actually going to see these characteristics because it's a little bit less clear than a tiger in its stripes but in the sense that you're not actually seeing something it's not that cut and dried or that simple but in fact it is quite obvious you can't experience reality without experiencing impermanent suffering and non-self it's why we suffer I mean, we don't actually suffer because of it. We suffer because we cling to things, thinking them to be other than impermanent suffering and non-self. And when our expectations are not met, we're disappointed, we're, we're, un, we're upset. So our meditation practice, it begins by closing our eyes and looking inside. And we make this shift, this paradigm shift to ultimate reality, to experiential reality. Seeing experiences arise and cease, come and go. The constant change. we begin to see these three characteristics and this is it's important to understand it's important to realize this is the process that we're going through this process of awakening to these three characteristics it leads us to let go to, to stop trying to find that which is or stop trying to make things or make reality permanent stable satisfying controllable Stop seeing it as me and mine and so on. We we look at these three, we, un we try, it's important to understand them. And so I just want to briefly, let's detail what we're talking about here. Impermanence is something you can understand in different ways. The Visuddhimagga gives a good description of how one discerns impermanence. Impermanence can be discerned in the sense that you see people have died and you say, wow, they were alive and now they're dead. And so you look at yourself and you say, I am alive and one day I will be dead as well. And that's probably the, one of the more coarse, most coarse understandings of, of impermanence, but it's still a sort of an understanding of impermanence. And then another person looks at their life as they're growing older and realizing when they were young, they were different than how they are when they're an adult, and then when they get older, they're now different 
from when they were an adult. And they see impermanence that way. And another person starts to go deeper and says, like last year, and then another person says last month, and then yesterday I was a different person. And an hour ago I was a different person seeing change. But a meditator, Buddha Gosa says, he says, a meditator, in the Buddha's teaching, we look at each movement or each experience, so we break the foot into six parts. We break the step, each step that we walk. There's a good example, just a good example. When you lift the heel, that's one experience, and there's birth and death in that moment. When you lift the foot, that's birth and death. When you move the foot, when you lower the foot, when you touch the foot, when you place the heel, meaning every moment, not just even one footstep, but each part of the footstep, is a birth and a death. It's it's a part of impermanence. You know, that that impermanence is in terms of experiences. And so when we talk about impermanence, we're really looking at this this realization that reality is made up of discrete moments that arise and cease not made up of entities it's not made up of lasting entities the body is not something that exists from moment to moment the mind as well is not something that exists from moment to moment all we have are moments of experience physical and mental aspects of of each experience Impermanence is really the the beginning of it all. It's the big problem. If things were permanent, well, you know, even if pain was was per lasted forever, you'd get used to it. You would. It would no longer be painful because you're like, oh yeah, this is comfortable. It's always like this. It's actually change that's the problem. That's what makes things suffering. Buddha said, Anicca vata sankhara upadava yadhamino upajitva nirujantite sangupa samosukho. Impermanent indeed are all formations subject to arise and fall. Having arisen, they cease. The stilling of them all is peace. Or is the is uh, is happiness? And so suffering we can understand in different ways. There's dukkha dukkha. Dukkha dukkha is this pain, is suffering that is suffering. So this is when you feel pain, or or when you feel anguish in the mind, physical and mental pain. Dukkha domanasa. And then there's uh, Sankara Dukkha. Sankara Dukkha is a little more interesting. Sankara Dukkha means the, the effort and the trouble one has to go about to maintain stability. So the work that a meditator does uh, undertakes in the beginning to try and stop themselves from experiencing the chaos. Find ways to not have certain experiences arise find ways to keep certain experiences keep the mind focused on the foot so you try to force it find ways and it, it, it's uh, stressful to try and create permanence or stability that's called sankara dukkha sankara in this sense in this case in this usage means the, the cultivation or forming something stable
but the most important type of suffering is called viparinama dukkha and it actually is that this idea that suffering comes from change things happen that you're not expecting and that you wish wish hadn't happened and it causes you stress or things that you like want they, they go away And simply the fact that reality is chaotic, unpredictable, and incessantly changing. This is how we understand suffering. Anatta, anatta, of course, is the most difficult one. Other religious teachings can teach and do teach impermanence and suffering, but what they one and all fail to teach is non-self. There are spiritual teachers who teach you to reduce your ego, but they they talk about reducing the ego in, in order to find a connectedness, a oneness with the universe, which is still very much the concept of self. And so when Buddhism teaches non-self, it's quite disconcerting to most people, even many meditators. What will happen to this self of mine? This is voiced in the Pali. It's not something new that people just came up with now that they're afraid of. Even in the Buddhist time, people said, if, wait, if I see non-self, what will happen to myself? What's going to happen to me? It's not something you have to worry about because you're not, you know, it's, it, it's a fact of life. It's already there. Nothing's going to change. Non-self is pointing out a problem with our paradigm, with the way we look at things, seeing things as me, as mine. It doesn't actually say this is or this isn't. Or uh, it doesn't actually say that there is or isn't a self. It doesn't actually. Exp it's not actually about whether you exist. Not exactly. I, mean, I don't want to get into the details of this, but I want to be clear that's not the point. And it's important because it again t speaks of the framework. If you're thinking in terms of whether I exist or don't exist, you're looking at things wrong. That view doesn't help any better than asking whether the body exists or doesn't exist. You're, you're thinking in terms of entities. If you start out from the point of view of experience, which is a very clever thing that the Buddha did, wise, I guess, I shouldn't just call him clever. Um, not I guess, it's a very wise thing. To, just want to be careful with my language. Um... then there's no question of whether I exist or don't exist. I isn't something you can experience. And what you see is what, what does exist. It would be ridiculous to think that this is me, this is mine. It's, it arises and ceases, it comes and goes. So let's be clear, clear what we're talking about. Mahasi Sayadaw does a good job describing four types of self. There is self as a possessor, owner, Self as the owner, self as the um, dweller, or one uh, self as as existing, as being some someone that exists. Yeah, there's self as the doer, and there's self as the experience or the one who feels. All of these are various ways of describing the self. And you can see they all involve an entity. And and so they start off on this wrong premise. The, the owner means looking at it, it, the idea that there is the owner. Um, what it actually leads to is perceptions of things as belonging to the self. Right. So the prob big glaring problem here is that it leads us to have ownership issues concerns over our possessions, even our body, when we see our body start to become wrinkled or fat or you know, whatever, we start to worry. 
when we when we break out in pimples it disturbs us as we think of these things as ours and then we we apply it to our possessions our house our car we apply it to other people my wife my husband my brother, my sister, my child, my friend, my enemy. All because of the idea of me, of mine. The 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 one who exists, this is you know, some people postulate just a niwasi niwasi, the one who, who dwells in the body or in, in the being. So the idea of a soul, just a general soul idea. Again, something you can't experience. It's a little bit less problematic, but it's all caught up in the same idea. It's just a theory, and it leads to all sorts of problems. Of, well, it leads to especially the problem of, of permanence, stability, thinking that I am a thing that exists. It prevents you from seeing reality clearly as it is and thereby leads to all sorts of problems. Disappointments when things change. When you see other people change, you wonder. Well, you don't even wonder. You get upset because you had this idea of them as an entity, a lasting entity. That's not who you are. You don't think this, but you feel it. You know, you were expecting them to always be the way you want them to be. This is why people we love anger us the most when they change. And then we have Karakahata. Karakahata is incredibly problematic, the doer. This is what leads us to try and force things, force our stomach to behave properly, force our minds to behave properly. Because I'm the one who's in charge, right? It's me who's doing it. Yeah. It's funny because it's not really important whether it is me or isn't me. But as soon as you start to think that way, you start to mess with things, right? It's the view. The view informs your actions. And when the way you look at things is in terms of I'm going to force this or I can force this. It doesn't matter whether you can or not. I'm not trying to say that you can, but doesn't matter because as soon as you try you mess stuff up as soon as you take that view everything gets all messed up you start forcing and this is what you feel from meditation and you start to reflect upon how this car this is carried out in life trying to force everything trying to control our lives control our circumstances and how much stress we come from being control freaks And finally, Vedakaatta. Vedakaatta is also quite interesting. It's in terms of the one who experiences. So we think of feelings as belonging to us. I mean, this is really the crux of it. If you weren't, if you you don't cry out in pain when you see some, or you don't, no, you don't get upset when you see some something bad happen to someone else. But when something bad happens to you, you lament. And so the same goes for pain. We, we Pain is not really a big problem except that we conceive of it as I am feeling pain. If we thought of it as pain arising, and you see, just that paradigm shift, that, that shift of views, makes you, you realize, you know, okay, so pain is this, this incredible pain that has arisen. It's not me and it's not mine. And then Visuddhimanga describes it as this, someone who looks off into the distance and sees a great raging bonfire and says, wow, if anybody falls into that fire, they're going to get burnt. But they don't get burnt themselves and they, they're not um, actually upset about it. This is how a meditator looks at pain. That'd be in great, great pain, right? But they look at it as a bonfire off in the distance. Yeah, if I 
If I got upset about that, boy, that could lead me to a lot of suffering. But since it's not me and it's not mine, since I'm not jumping in that fire, it has no power over me. And so this is how we understand non-self. This is the most important aspect of our insight meditation practice, realizing these three. Now, it's not our practice. The practice itself is the satipatthana. You don't practice these things. You just practice looking. And that's why insight meditation practice is so simple. There's not a lot of complicated dogmas or rituals that you have to perform. It's just simply reminding yourself, this is this. Because you're just looking at the stripes on a tiger. You're just looking at what's already there. Stopping yourself from missing that from forgetting that, from avoiding that, keeping yourself present. That's all you have to do. Keep yourself present. There is absolutely no question as to whether you'll see the stripes on the tiger. All right. So there you go. That's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. I've got these three men here, house full of men these days. And they're all anguishing over sitting here. Back to practice. that I can access uh, the questions online here on my other device. So I'm going to go through some of the questions on the on the internet. Would you recommend for a beginning lay meditator to experiment with intensive meditation as would be done on retreat? If one manages to push behind, beyond the disliking and aversion, do you believe this would be of great use? Cultivating discipline and relentlessness. Yeah, I mean, those are good words to describe um, the sorts of things you would get out of it. Now, it's missing the other factors like proper practice. Without a teacher, how do you be sure? What is your guiding light to make sure you stay on, on path? Right. So intensive meditation is more if you if you if you're doing non-intensive meditation you're able to you have a lot more time to step back and and reflect on whether you're doing it properly. If you do intensive meditation you're much more engrossed in the activity and there's much more uh, potential for uh, for danger, I guess, so for lack of a better word, for you to get in the wrong path. And so without daily supervision from a teacher, I mean, it's, it, teaching is, is in many cases just a matter of listening to what the meditator says and being perceptive as to whether they're screwing it up and getting them back on track with just a few words often. Often just answers to their questions, but without that it's easy to Without a mirror, we don't have a mirror that allows us to see into our hearts. So it's not that it's 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 just potentially problematic to go to go it alone. Can one do sitting meditation in the morning and walking meditation in the evening, then change it up the next day? You can. I mean. It's a free country, it's a free world, I mean, everyone can do what they want, but walking meditation has benefits to sitting meditation, so doing it first has benefits. Okay, here's a long question about August St. Augustine. The gist of it is, well, St. Augustine, and it's apropos of tonight's talk, um, he un his understanding of impermanence and suffering later in the age helped him cope with the loss of his family. 
Do you think that people can come to the same understanding of these concepts through their belief and dependency on an all-knowing permanent God or even without practicing meditation? Right, so yes, they can come to understand to a limited extent, not deeply, no, um, impermanence and suffering. Now without some form of meditative awareness, and it doesn't have to be meditation practice, it can just be such a strong sense of mindfulness Without that they can't become enlightened They can't truly see impermanence or suffering But the belief in an all-powerful God Is going to get in the way very much Of the more important one that you've left out of this question And that's the belief in the, or the, no, the perception of non-self right, What we talked about So your, your concept of a God is, is, is an awareness that is um, Keeping you from Looking at reality in terms of arising and ceasing Now, one would hope that such views would go away Through the practice of insight meditation But if you cling to it Then every time you're confronted with the possibility That everything might be imp impermanent You fall back on God And that prevents you from seeing this truth I'm without the ability to do walking meditation Thus is a hand motions exercise ample replacement uh, would, would such hand movements have the same benefit and utility as walking meditation Generating energy and increasing effort and concentration No, potentially not because it's not involving the whole body Now mentally, you could argue it's quite similar But physically, walking is of great benefit And psychologically as well um, keeping your body moving Getting your body moving Not just your hands But getting your body moving is, is more natural right? It has a calming effect In many cases It has a sort of a um, Grounding effect You know, sitting still Is just too intense in many cases So walking has its benefits That you're not going to get From the hand movements But, you know, people who are paralyzed It doesn't mean they can't do it doesn't mean you have to do walking meditation, it's just quite useful. What is your take on the Brahma Vihara? How to incorporate metta during the day with our insight practice? Well, I've talked about this in, in regards to the four protective meditations. It's certainly useful, it's something you certainly can engage in. It's not in it is compatible and you know, I mean even during your meditation session, if you start to feel very upset about Something or you know angry towards someone You send them good thoughts Wish them to be happy If you feel sad or you're worried about someone You can wish them to be free from suffering If you feel jealous You can make a determination You know May they, may they keep what they have you know, may, may they long have The things that they have And expressing an appreciation For, for other people and equanimity, equanimity in this sense, of course, just referring to all beings. If you're uh, judging people or you're angry or have a bitter feud with someone, you remind yourself, they will go according to their karma. There's no need to like or dislike certain people or you know, be upset about certain people or, or so on when we're reminded that everyone goes according to their karma. So you can do that even within your, your session Just take a few minutes I wouldn't take a long period of time Or do it a lot But it's something that recenters you And refocuses your attention So those are the online questions Does anybody here have questions? I'd ask that if you do ever have questions, please type them out in advance and then just paste them in because otherwise I sit here not knowing if anyone... I can't tell when you're... I've turned off that typing animation as well, so I don't know whether someone is even typing, but even that is misleading because it's really hard to tell whether someone's actually ready to answer ask a question. Or you can just like type Q or something to let me know that you've got a question.
Alright, I'm going to assume there are no questions and wish you all a good night. Thank you for coming. <laughs>